Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar M. Hotep, with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And today is Kaumba Friday, January the 27th, 2023. And we have a very, very dynamic guest with us. We are welcoming back Professor James Small. And we're going to be talking about the upcoming Hoppy Black Excellence Conference that is going to be held in New York City on Saturday, February the 4th of 2023. So all that and more will return in just a moment. I do apologize, uh, first and foremost, for the last minute um, advertisement of today's show. Um, it, it was literally put on at last minute. And so I'm out and about, so I don't know if you could hear any kind of music in the background. So I'll try to, uh, while we're doing the interview, make sure that my mic is muted uh, so it won't be too much uh, of the background. But I, I do appreciate each and every one of you who, although last minute, um, are joining us live. And then, of course, peace, love, and blessings to each of you who are going to be catching the archives. And uh, for those of you who are new to the channel, make sure that you subscribe to the channel uh, so that when we do these last minute uh, live shows, that regardless, you will get the notification that we are going live. And you can join us, you know, all. So um, a few announcements. I'm, I'm still working on the text uh, Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, uh, Towards an Etymology of the Place Named Kemet. Um, I actually paused for a little bit because I... Uh, have put together a journal article uh, for review and I'm going to submit and have that published first before I actually release the book. Uh, so more on that in the near future. And just because I have it uh, next to me, if you haven't gotten uh, Dr. Amos Wilson's blueprint for Black Power, uh, shame on you. And um, I will Shame each and every one of you who does not have uh, that text. But I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. And of course, I'd like to shout out everyone who has joined, you know, and made themselves known via the chat. So peace and blessings to Brother Robert Rand. Uh, New York is in the building. We have Sister uh, Jolanda Zachary in the building, uh, all the way from Florida. We have Imhotep Ross in the building, our good brother from H-Town, Brother Chavez, is in the building. Simply Save and Sister Safa is in the building. In the Flesh is in the building. Uh, Teak Wellbeing is in the building. Please and blessings to you. Sister Mika, also all the way out there in Florida, is in the building. And Reggie Reyes, if I'm saying that correctly, is in the building. And this is a question you asked. Hey, do you know what is Palo Mayombe? We could possibly talk about that uh, uh, a little bit later. But right now, we are interviewing um, our good elder, Professor James Small, 
And we got Ernest in the building all the way from Norfolk, Virginia. Peace and blessings. Welcome to you. And thank you, Sister Mika, for reminding uh, each and every person to... That is right. Hit the like button and make sure that you share the video so that uh, everyone else in your circle can join this conversation. And so we will get things started. So as I mentioned earlier, oh, and the just before that, because um, we're talking about the Black Excellence Conference. Uh, although I interviewed her, it was a pre-recorded interview. I recently uh, shared the interview of Dr. Uh, Susan Tata, and we had a conversation on polygamy from a village perspective. So if you haven't seen that interview, please uh, go visit the channel and you can uh, check that interview out. She will also she is one of the featured speakers, so she's coming all the way from Europe to uh, speak at this conference. And also at the conference, of course, is our good professor, uh, James Small. And for those of you who do not know who Professor James Small is, he is a scholar, activist, a dynamic speaker, organizational consultant. He is also the CEO of the Sanaa Lodge Enterprise in Ghana, or well, surprising, yeah, in Ghana, CEO and president of African American Management Company, also in Ghana, uh, international vice president, organization of Afro American Unity. He is a priest of Oya. He's also a Baba Larisha in the uh, Isheshe Ifa tradition, and is the past president of the Eastern Region of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization, better known as ASCAP. Uh, he taught for 15 years at the City University of New York. And, you know, he had the opportunity to uh, study under many of our greats, uh, including Dr. John Henry Clark and Professor um, Dr. Ben, uh, as well as many others who is, is too deep to name. Um, but now he is one of our elders. Uh, he has, uh, in many respects, taken on that um, that role that the, those elders ha have been for him, for many of us in this community. So it is an honor and pleasure to welcome to the program Professor James Small. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, sir. Peace and blessing, brother Assad. And thank you for having me on the program. I want everybody to understand I'm wearing my martial arts 52 blocks shirt ah. every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. So <clears throat> you need to think yeah. about studying the 52 block system. Um, they're in many, many states now. Um, and the 52 blocks in the, is not an Asian system, but it's pretty much uh, an African American and African system of mm. hand techniques mostly blocking against knives, guns, choke holes, et cetera. But it is a system that evolved in urban Black America over the last 40 years, even though others have adopted it and call it their own. Mm -hmm. We need to own the flowers, you know? Uh, it's interesting you say that because um, I'm going to be doing a presentation in probably like a week or two. Mm -hmm. um, it'll definitely be two weeks on um, um, reconceptualizing, uh, you know, hip hop, hip hop culture. And mm -hmm. I've given each of the so-called four elements I, I've, I've created. Well, I haven't created. I've, I've added an official fifth element, which has been there since the beginning. And I know people have added on elements over the years, but everything is centered under uh, or framed under this phenomenon that we are very familiar with in the Yoruba tradition and the Yoruba language called Ashe. 
And every element is going to have ashe added to a Yoruba word that represents that particular element. And, and in that, the fifth element is the martial arts. And um, which, I, which I call Eshegu. Um, and it's three martial arts that I'm saying needs to be uh, studied and, and recommended for those who are part of the culture. And one is Capoeira, one is uh, Jiu Jitsu, and the other is 52 Blocks. And 52 Blocks also incorporates uh, weapons in terms of uh, yeah. guns and going to the gun range and stuff too. So I'm guns, putting for those who yeah. everything. So um, so it's just interesting that you, you, you said that because uh, that's, that's something I'll be promoting. Yeah, Sensei yeah. Mo Mahalio, who, who is an extraordinary master. He's actually in Senegal right now for the Senegalese and West African um, indigenous wrestling com mm. competition, which should end this week. He should be coming back home this week. Yeah, I want to get him on the show. Yeah, uh, you, you love this, brother. He, he was my student at, at college. I remember when I gave him the room to open his first martial arts class. So mm. I'm, I haven't really been a, a fighter fighter in the rank and file. All of my fighting uh -huh. has been for the revolution. Uh -huh. So rarely have I fought for belt rank, but I will on the 25th of February be granted a red belt, um, mm. more for my historical contribution to the Harlem New Breed. That's how a master um, dojo um, institute by some of the masters. Um, but everybody should be in the arts. Every African ethnic nation has a martial arts form. Mm -hmm. Like any nations, everybody have them. Um, but a lot of attention haven't been paid to ours. Um, mm -hmm. What's up, brother? Uh, we lost our brother to COVID out in uh, Detroit two years ago. God, I can't. But he was very big in, into the African martial oh. arts system. Um, you know him. I forgot the name, but I don't know who you're talking about. He, yeah. he worked out in Houston a lot. He was participating mm -hmm. in some, a lot of the Tai Chi stuff down in Houston through the years. Yeah, it's like, he, uh, it's, what is it? Uh, ah. It'll, it'll kick in. It'll come to Yeah. But people don't tie the martial arts because in our system we don't call it martial arts because the emphasis in the west is on the martial the emphasis mm -hmm. in the africa was on the spiritual aspect of the system the martial was simply there to protect the indigenous ah oh, baba kalindi thank you yes yeah baba kalindi out of detroit who was one of the great masters um you know even Kung Fu, which evolves out of the Indian subcontinent from the African-based community, actually coming out of Kemet into India, when the Sholan Monastery is, is created, it is not an Asiatic phenomenon. It will become an Asiatic phenomenon as it moves into Asia. But what we know as the foundation to the great Sholan Monastery and the beginning of, of, of Kung Fu is an African phenomenon, not an Asian phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that stuff I taught over the years in the dojos around the tri-state area. And um, I, you remember the the, <clears throat> the group Black Mombasa? Yeah, out of South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah. Right. And they did this piece with Paul Simon, you remember? And the leader of Black mm -hmm. Mombasa was killed shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. If you ever watch the video and you watch him dancing on the sand dunes, he's mm -hmm. doing... The, one of the South African martial system, which he wasn't supposed to do because the system is tied to the indigenous society of secrets or secret societies. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he lost his life, the head of Black Mombasa, because there's some things you can't expose, which happened to Bruce Lee as well, because mm -hmm. he was not supposed to expose certain things to non-initiated people, and he did. And it's, it's costly if you're part of these deep societies and you take an oath not to do something and you get carried away up here and do it, um, 
bad things can happen, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Good people, you know, it means well. But a Indeed. fighting system every people have, because fighting systems protect your philosophical system, your spiritual carriers of your philosophical system. You know, that's the purpose for developing a fighting system. It wasn't for warfare or attacking other people or taking other people material wealth. It was to protect those who carried the sacred wisdom, those who we call priests, but our word was not the same thing as we call priests today or preachers today. They, they, they were talking mm -hmm. about scientists in multiple disciplines that were masters of those science, sciences. But that's not what we were talking about tonight. I don't know how I got there, but I wanted to know. What <laughs> well, you got there because you you were advertising the shirt. But uh, yeah, it is. It's a beautiful system, and um, but yeah, we we're here to discuss the upcoming uh, conference out in um, New York City. But before we get there, I just want to ask first and foremost. Is there anything that you personally have going on or upcoming that you would want to announce? I got so much stuff. I'm not going to announce anything. I just want right. to tell people to send their prayers out for Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who's recovering mm -hmm. from uh, cardiac surgery and that he's doing very well. Um, we hope he'll be home from rehab in another week or two. You know, he's 86 years old as of the 19th uh, of this month. Um, and so we want our elder to get back home, heal well, be strong. Um, he's one of our last master teachers in that age grouping, him and his wife, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries. And Dr. Sister Jeffries is doing well. Just send your prayers and your ashes out to them. Um, I think they'll appreciate to know that, you know, I'll, I'll tell them that you have thus done so. But other than that, I'm cool. I am going to be doing a trip to Kemet and Ghana the last week in July and the first week in August. So you mm -hmm. can contact Professor Small, AfricanWorld.com on that one because I'm just putting it together. I just, just made up my mind to do it. Um, so it's going to be like two weeks Ghana, one week in Kemet, then come to Ghana and people have an option one week in Ghana or two weeks in Ghana. And if you just want to do Ghana, you can do that. If you just want to do Kemet, you can do that. So indeed, well, African if world. You, put that in. I'm a, I'm gonna put that in, and and also you can if you want to know more about uh, our good professor, make sure that you visit uh, the website professorjamesmall uh, dot com. And so I am going to share my screen real quick and uh, so that y'all can see if you go to hoppyfilm.com you can get more information on uh, the Black Excellence Conference that we're uh, speaking about right now, as well as, you know, be able to purchase your tickets, uh, which is this green button here. But looking at the lineup, uh, let me go back here. We have, of course, Professor James Small. We have Dr. Kaba Kamini. We have our good brother, Infudishi Chihuti Mess. We have Dr. Susan Tata. We have brother Riza Islam and Dr. Georgina Falu, and I believe our good brother, Dr. Ken Harris, yes, he is the host. And there's also going to be um, a performance by the, the hip hop group uh, Brand Nubian that you see here, as well as Sister Lyrical Faith. So it is a conference slash concert uh, dynamic duo that will um, be be held in New York City on uh, Saturday, February the 4th, 2023. And I believe the new time now is from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. 
as Brother Taki had uh, just texted me earlier. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about the conference and what is its focus and yes. and what you'll be speaking about when you, when you yes. when we get there? Um, one of the things we, we left out, there will be a showing of the movie Hoppy. Okay. We'll be looking at, we'll have a dynamic preview of the movie Happy. We'll also have a preview out of, um, and Happy is, is presented by Taki Grant. And um, then we'll have um, a showing of the movie, um, the documentary, Heavy as the Crown, Out of Darkness, or Out of Darkness, Heavy as the Crown, by Chris Amadeus. Amadeus Chris. Both of them are extraordinary features. Will blow your mind in the water, no matter how you approach it. The film Hoppy will be one of the main features. The film Heavy as the Crown or Out of Darkness, Heavy as the Crown by Amadeus is also extraordinary. And Grand Nubia is just off the chain right now. It's just a lyrical fate. Just those portions, if that's all you had, it would be a fantastic weekend, right? But then you have all of the name speakers that Brother Asar just mentioned. And the idea is to, again, do what Happy's foundation is about, is to spread the need for Black economic development and Black economic excellence and to tie our economic development to our political and cultural renewals and development. So that is going to be the thrust of, of the, the conference and the discussions. I will, of course, be speaking on spirituality, but it'll be woven into economic politics and culture, you know, the nature of spirituality. A friend of mine's little innocent 16-year-old angel said to her the other day, she said, Mommy, the God in my heart is six years old because I'm six years old. I never thought of it like that, right? And she told her mother, the God in your, in your heart is your age, you know? And then she went even further talking about how this thing that we call the gods, you know, this, this totality of everything is everything. And this is a six-year-old. But the six-year-old can articulate that God is everything and that God lives within you and that each individual's divinity or notion of divinity is the same age as that individual in that you grow your divinity. Okay. You grow your divinity. And that's why you need to be in a culture that is suitable for your divine growth on all levels. You know, even keeping your body healthy. This is the temple of the divine. And you keep that temple he healthy because you want your psycho spiritual or energy divine to have a physiological divine temple to live in. And so th this this is this is um, what we are going to talk about. That you cannot separate your spirituality from your reality. And people have been making that mistake, talking about my reality on one level, then the spirituality like it's some sort of mechanical aside that you can screw on to yourself. No, they're all the same thing being expressed through different venues, you know? And so I'm gonna tie spirituality and reality into economic politics and cultural development of black excellence and the black world community. <clears throat> now, when you say spirituality, we kind of mm -hmm. take that that word for granted and yeah. and so when I, I guess it's a two-part question so when when you say spirit mm -hmm. what do you mean and then when you right. say spirituality what do you right. mean okay when i say spirit so i'd stop using the word and then i find them folks it's gonna take them some time to catch up at african sacred science so i said let me back back up the train a little bit and let him get on. When I'm talking about spirituality, I'm talking about the totality of our ancestors' understanding of reality. Okay? 
See, the whole, our whole cult, what we call culture, is based on our ancestors' observation, contemplation, and interpretation of the laws of the cosmos and the laws of nature. How does that affect us? How do we affect this? How did that interplay take place? What is the process you can put together to have a harmonious interplay between the human being, between what we call nature and everything that lives in it, and then the cosmology and everything that it is energy-wise and so forth. What, you know, when we created all the notions in Kemet, we sat and watched the moon. The moon goes through a cycle. If you watch it repetitively, you can see that the cycle is repeated and repeated, repeated. The assumption then that is a fundamental, that is a law. If you watch the sun and it's 24 hour, you can do the same thing. Every 24 hours, it reaches the same place again. Okay. Repeated enough time, we can assume that's a constant, that's a law. We watch any given star constellations. Not only does the constellation move through the sky, but the stars in the constellation also change places. If you watch it long enough, you will see a repetition of both the star's position and the constellation's position. But not only that, but what is happening in the heaven has a correlation to what happens on earth at the same time those things are happening, right? And so our ancestors are trying to interpret their realities. That is our sacred science. And we, we are trying to find how do we be as harmoniously involved in it as the bumblebee, as the butterfly, as the flower, as the water, you know? We have, the human being, the seeming audacity to trouble the waters where the laws of the universe is concerned, let's say. And so we came up with a system which we call culture. We have cultivated the knowledge of the, this whole cosmological, ecological, um, constant repeating and not only repeating because nothing seemingly in the universe as much as it looks constant it is not constant because there's a subtlety of innovation you know and emulation that's constantly going on but it's all done in a harmony and a rhythm based on an understanding of his workings and so that's what our ancestors put into those the music and the drumming and the dancing to explain things. We think of it, we think of me, if I hear an African drumming and I'm in Africa, I want to dance because I'm used to that's what you do to music. I can't hear the language explaining with rhythm and vibration a phenomena that takes place in the universe or in nature. But if I learn the language now, because it's all in the language, and I've heard you speak speak very well on the you matter of fact you're probably for me the foremost person on interpreting African language and its meaning because I've listened to you and and so if I'm in Ashanti for instance and a Tumfo a Pokawari or a Tumfo Ose Tutu who's now the current king of kings of the Ashanti nation is coming out you see some people with some sticks right playing a drum, tum, 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 tum. And we'll hear the good music and the good drumming, but guess what the Shanti hear? They hear tree. They hear the tree language in the sticks and the skin. They hear the vibration of their language just as if you'd spoken to them with your lips. If I was a Mount Chim, they would use a horn. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. And in the horn, they reach a vibration pitch where the people can hear the Achim language, not just music. And so this whole sort of, so when I'm talking about spirituality, I'm talking about our harmonization with the rest of nature and the rest of the ecology we call our, the environment we live in down here. And I'm, when I talk about sp that spirit, but spirit, I'm talking about that energy, that vibration that moves between me and you, that moves between me and things, all things around me. When I talk about spirituality, I'm talking about the system of understanding that Africans call their culture. That system of understanding that they call their culture. That was, that's what we're calling spirituality. 
They didn't use that word. They didn't need to. We're trying to reference it. And we use a Western word that may not fully grasp it, even though we know the word spirits come from the word numa when we go by the Hebrew and it means, you know, the, the air or the breath. But it's more than just the breath, you know. It, it's, it's, it's my breathe. Every time I breathe, I affect everything else in existence, like the ripple in the water if I throw a rock in it, because my very breathing has caused a disturbance, you know. And so when I talk about spirituality, I'm talking about being conscious of that relationship and trying to practice the finding of the harmony between you and the rest of existence. To me, that would be spirituality. Methodologies that we refer to as culture depends on the ecology that you find yourself in when you're trying to explain this relationship. Because the guy in the desert certainly can't explain the relationship to the rest of the existence as the guy in the rainforest, because they got different tools, you know? The guy in the savannah can't do it the same way the guy in the river valley, they got different tools. But the intent is absolutely the same. How do I find harmony and balance between me and interaction with cosmology and ecology? That's spirituality to me when it can be lived and practiced and taught through some system of education that we call culture. I know that's a long way around to it, but that, that end part is about the, 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 what I see as its meaning. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you say that in terms of, of the the notion that spirit, the word spirituality itself may not be able to capture the the fundamental essence of what the the African people were dealing with. And it's because of that, I have the same uh, understanding of that as well. And of course, looking through the language, this is one of the reasons why we promote this term here. I don't know if y'all could see it on the shirt, but it says Kimoyo. Kimoyo. And, and Moyo is the root, Ki is the prefix. And so Moyo is it's a literal word for heart, but it has derived meanings of spirit, soul, um, vitality, life. And, and it's even used as a greeting, you know, in terms of welcoming. Mm -hmm. And then ki is, it's, it's like, like when you say ki swahili, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in this sense, it is used for more so like the, the art or the manner of something. So as it is explained by Dr. Fukiao, it is, it is built off of this fundamental notion that the universe is teeming with life and vitality. And what essentially Kimoyo is, as I've defined it, is essentially the art of adding life to life. And, and there's some more deeper things, but that's the fundamental thing that I've, that I've noticed looking and studying and participating in, in African wisdom traditions uh, for, for the number of years in which I've had. And, and they all seem to have this notion that, um, you know, that life fluctuates. So like, that's why we have this logo here. So you see the positive and negative, and then it's supposed to be kind of like the flow of life. So when something is down, it, it is how do we we find and attract the vitality of life and add it to these areas that need, you know, resurrecting or, um, or just needs that energy to, to work more harmoniously, you know, in, in things of that nature. And so, you know, there's, there's those of us working on trying to find the right terms so that we can use mm -hmm. In, in, instead of the, the no Western terms. There is no the term, but they are yeah. terms. Okay. <laughs> that little baby, that little six-year-old, told her mother the other day, God, my God lives in my heart. And what <laughs> you just said about Kimoyo, 
Yeah. Um, and this is a six-year-old angel because she's still innocent. She's mm-hmm. still in the universe. She hasn't been contaminated and tampered with yet. So she can tell her mama in total innocent as though she was the teacher that my God lives in my heart. Yeah, I go like, wow, that's that's deep, you know. And then when she added the part that I'm six, so my God is six. Because I suddenly realized the day before I saw this thing of we all grow our God. We all grow our divine. The degree to which we understand our divinity is the degree to which we have grown it within us, you know, based on the knowledge, of course, and understanding that we gather. Um, I forgot what speech you were doing. It was not too long ago. But you're at a place in the language that I haven't seen anybody else been able to go except Fukiai, but he came out of the language of the Bantu system of Congo. Um, so that was expected, but you've been away from home and you've had to find your way back and you seemingly have found it in a way that I haven't seen anybody else uh, find it. Um, I, I know that just living in the system and coming out of a root woman's house and being raised by a root woman and for those who don't know, that's an indigenous priestess of the African-American people. Um, even though we are still not accepted by our own people overtly, we have never not have our indigenous system with us here in North America. We may have had to hide it, minimize it, even compromise it in the church to save it, but we've always had it. And so that lady who raised me and taught me about Africa from the time I was born, I was telling a sister the other day, there was some of my rearing I didn't understand that I was, though I had the men in the house, I was a child that wasn't raised by the men. I was raised by the women. It was so deliberate that it was an annoyance to me when I was young and I felt bad because they call me their little girl. It wasn't just my mother. There was the three other elders in the village. And they just, they raised me. And and even the toys they bought me was different. I was always bought soldiers. And I never made an equation until a few years ago. All oh, those little soldiers they bought me. They must have known what I was going to do with my life, right? But I had all of this, this kinds of things. Um, you remember the movie Paladin? You may be a little young. A Western movie about a guy with a big gun. And he had a chess horse. He had a um, a knight, a chess knight on his holster. And his name was Paladin. And the gun was this long. And I remember my grandmother, don't buy this for nobody else, but she buys me, the younger guy, this big Paladin gun, right? <laughs> and it, after I became an adult, I go like, what was that old lady trying to prepare me for? You know, my work with the party, the Black Liberation Army, with the OAU, with Malcolm Muslim Massey. What was she preparing me for that I didn't have a clue when I was a child? But somehow, those old women in that village on Acadia who made me theirs, I didn't know why they treated me that way. And I, I used to, I can't even tell the whole story on here because the other guys wouldn't, I wanted to be celibate. Just wanted to be, just <laughs> strange thing for a dude, right? I wanted to be celibate until I got married. And I fought for it. I made it to 18. I almost made it. But the guys would not even go out with me because if I would go with them, I would not make the moves they were going to make. So if I didn't make my move with the sister, I was with the other sister, wasn't going to make the move. So they just dissed me. (laughs) And I had to have my own little world. But I learned something from the old people on that plantation. They didn't lose Africa. They had to capsulize it and minimize it because of the, con- the, the condition they found their lives, but they never lost it. And that's when I see you, a lot of what I see come out of you is not, um, is not what we can call scholastic, okay? See, I would call it spirit and others would have a problem there. I don't have a problem with what I see coming from you because I know what it is. Right. Um, You've gone beyond boundaries already as young as you are, you know, and and because there is a spirit about you. 
you obviously got it from your grannies and your parents because something else we, and we've talked about, I've heard you talked about it, that each of us are our ancestors. Contained within me is my mom and my dad. Contained within them, within me is their mom and dad. For contained within them, in, in them and within me is my great grannies, which is the eight, and my great great to sixteen, and my great great to thirty, to my great great sixty four, and on into infinity until we get back to what we call the divine itself. So, if we're the totality of everything that is possible in a human experience from the first occasion when the universe decide to become human, then we are divinity. But how do we find that again? And that process that we call spirituality is the pathway. But I, again, I don't like that word and I'm sorry we even have to use it. I prefer it and I remember sitting with my sister segment before she left, Dr. Patricia Newton. It was me who, referred to her to let's not call our conference spirituality, but let's call it African sacred science. And the last conference that she and Hunter and myself did, uh, Hunter, Dr. Hunter Adams, was that um, concept, trying to bring forward the concept of African sacred science. But you know, she passed away the week before we made the next step in that presentation. You have been doing it. You've been doing it in your writing. I hear you, but I listen to you just because I don't say nothing to that. I hear you. And 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 I've, I've spent enough time in Africa. I've seen enough miracles, but people over here call miracles. Um, I've seen the dead come back to life, what people over here would call miracle. Um, I've seen things that is some I would never talk about because who's gonna believe it anyway, <laughs> okay, except a few who you dare talk to it about, that there is an understanding that can be developed in the human psyche that can inform the rest of the human beingness that would allow for them to understand how to be at one with the rest of nature. We will never be allowed to defeat the, the ISPET or the white man or the European idea concept because we're fighting to do the wrong thing. We're fighting to defeat something that the universe finds as essential. On your shirt, you got a sign for positive and a sign for negative. You know, I think there's a statue in Kemet um, of um, Ramses III. It's one of the most beautiful of the statues. And he's holding a staff, a big staff. And on one side of him is, um, Heru, and the other side of him is Set. Okay, the perfect balance. Set is not evil. He's not the devil. He's as essential as Heru. In order for perfection to exist, you know, and so you can't say negative is bad and positive is good, because if positive is not appropriately placed, it is negative. You know, the problem with the world is not the white man. He's doing exactly what nature designed him to do. The problem with the world is the black man. We've lost our function. We've lost our place. We are not doing what nature designed us to do. We're not thinking as nature designed us to think. We're not appropriating as nature defined us to appropriate. And until we can find that space, and I think that space can only be found through culture and a deep understanding of the language. Um, I don't know which one of our languages is our oldest system, but I know most of the systems we see, because I, I see Africans having one language with a bunch of, um, what do you call the, other, the um, dialects. People say, oh, I met this kid and he spoke five languages. No, he speaks <laughs> one language. But he's got five dialects. They're so distinct to me and you, they appear to be languages. And some of them may have their own rules, depending on how long it's been in place and the ecology it's been evolving in. But for the most part, it's got a parent, and that parent is singular. Mm -hmm. okay. And so that's how, when I think about spirituality, these are the depths and the realms I go into because I've seen things and I've experienced things 
I'll give you one good experience. I'm in Mecca. I'm a Muslim man. And most people don't know when Malcolm X gets assassinated, I take over the mosque. I'm the imam of the Muslim Mosque, Inc. I go to Mecca in 1974 to make my first pilgrimage. I'm thinking in all the fantasies, I actually thought I would see Malcolm over there and that the whole thing of him being dead which was a myth. And that I'm coming carrying his banner that him and I would meet and Malcolm would tell me what I had to do and I could come back to America and do my work. Cause that didn't happen like that. What did happen though, I go over there with my Negro Almanac. You remember that book? I mean, you're kind of young, right? <laughs> but it was a big I'm book. I'm familiar with it though. Okay. The Negro Almanac and J.R. Rogers, Black Man of Color. Well, I took those two books with me because part of what you do on a pilgrim is teach and talk about your culture. And I began to do that in Jeddah to some Nigerian soldiers. And the Nigerian soldiers was there because the Arabs had killed many Africans in the street the year before. So Nigeria sent its National Guard into Jeddah to protect the African pilgrims. And it sent this Boy Scout to clean and police the area where Africans from multiple countries would live. And so I just kind of fold in under them, myself and Malcolm's nephew, Rodnell Collins, Ella's son. And the Saudis had an issue with me talking about black history. So the soldiers brought their generals on the second night to challenge me and they told me I was lying. I gave them the books and the generals were blown away. The next night they brought 200 soldiers. So the Saudis turned me over to the CIA, all right, to get me out of their country. They said I was a troublemaker. I'm holding these T-Shack forums, etc. I escaped from the CIA. I'm not gonna tell you how I did that, but I managed to escape in Jeddah get back into Mecca, which they couldn't come and retrieve me. But when I show up two weeks later, hungry, starving, broke, I couldn't get home because they wouldn't let me out of the country. They was just gonna let me sit there and die from malaria, my nice Muslim brothers. So I'm, I take off the white cloth and I put on, I wanted to feel African. I had one dashiki, a blue one with leopard spots. And I put on my dashiki jeans and some sneakers, but I'm hungry. I done stole food for a couple of weeks. And, I'm broke. I don't know if I'll ever get home. The other brother has left me standing. He went back to America. And I'm sitting on a curb in Jeddah and I'm crying because I think it's done. I'm seeing thousands die every day and they're being marched around the cob on board wrapped in white. And I'm thinking, which day is going to be my day? And will my family ever get my body? Right? So I'm saying, heck with all that. I'll die. I'm sitting on the curb. I'm crying. And a man comes up to me. I'm in Saudi Arabia now. And this man starts speaking to me in a language I don't understand. And I said, oh, sir, I'm sorry. I speak only English. He says, oh, I speak English, you know, with an accent. And he says, what is the problem? And I told him my situation. I have no money, broke, I'm hungry, I'm sick. The Saudis won't honor my ticket to go home and I'm gonna die. And he says, no, you're not gonna die. Now this man is jet black and he's wearing a full Yoruba booba in Saudi Arabia, right? No white cloth, full Yoruba booba. And he takes me to French Airways and after fighting to get my passport, he buys me a ticket and that's how I get home, leaving out a lot of details. And I don't know to this day whether that was a man or a God. I never seen him again, never heard from him again. No, nothing. But that's how I came home, ended up in a hospital fighting for my life, survived. Who was that man? Who, who was the man in the Yoruba dress? That's when I left Islam and moved wholeheartedly into the Yoruba tradition. Okay, this is 74. I started studying the tradition in 68. But for not to, if I say this to somebody, that sounds like a phenomenon. There's more, which I will not say over the, over the medium, but life and death and making this agreements for your coming back. But there is things beyond this cluster of matter and the infantile periphery of energy we formed around it that we call our spirit or our soul or whatever. 
There are things bigger than that that we can articulate if we get a deeper understanding. You've been doing an excellent job of it. You know, I've watched you for a long time. You've been doing an excellent job of it. Um, Wade Nobles and Vera Nobles do an excellent job, but they have not gone into certain spaces that you've gone into, into going back into you know how Fukuyama says, I'm, 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 um, when he talks about the egg thing, um, I can't remember it now, but you've gone back into the soul of the ancestors. You've gone back in the soul and the language thing. I really, I always thought I understood that the language was significant and that was the ship that was carrying the spiritual knowledge and understanding. But you showed it to me in the last speech. I'm trying to remember where I saw you the last time. But in that last time you were speaking and I was somehow there, you showed me that it was right. That, that, that language is the barge. That is the vehicle. That has the stuff in it. All right. And then the way you were dissecting it, and you call it etymology and that type of understanding and linguistic, but you were dissecting it so one could peel the language back and see that the knowledge we are looking for never went anywhere. It did not destroy our culture. It did not die. It got hidden. It got camouflaged. But it is still there to be unwrapped. And that's what you've been doing. It's almost like layers. And you've been unwrapping these layers of this understanding of the universe that we call culture, which is your primary education system. Um, they reduce culture to dancing and music and think that those are tools of culture. They're not culture unto themselves. Culture is the concepts, ideas, and principle that they are to convey. And those concepts, ideas, and principle come out of the very intrinsic knowledge of our ancestors through the billions or millions of years that they were evolving uh, uh, down here as these things we call human. If that makes sense, I'm going to try to simplify this into economic <laughs> politics and culture. And how do we open more black banks? Only 4% of the businesses in America are owned by black people, even though we are more than 13% of the population in terms of the African American English speaker. One of the crimes that America commits against us that Africans who are French speakers are not counted in our census with us. Africans who are Spanish speakers are not counted in our census with us. If the Spanish speaking African and the French speaking African and the most indigenous from the continent, most recent arrival from the continent, it's kind of, we're the largest ethnic group in America. But they know that. We have to have sense enough to know that whether they say that or, or not. You see, we have to get that clear that we don't want the enemy's language don't change our race. You know, and, and so that's going to be a part of my discussion. How do we get the fusion between the Spanish speaking Africans, between the French speaking Africans, between the most recent arrival of Africans from the continent and that indigenous African who was here when the slave ship came was amalgamated with those who are, were on the slave ship and would call themselves African American. How do we create that fusion? That's a cultural thing that has to occur. It's a spiritual thing that has to occur. And I don't know if there's any, Yoruba may come the closest, but I know, don't know if there's any um, form of practice of indigenous religion right now that's big enough to do the job because we, are so, we have so Christianized the indigenous systems, if you understand what I'm, I'm meaning. Um, we, we've, we say Alafia, we say Odabo, we talk about Ifa, and we, we do all the things we do. But we do them like people do Christianity. We do them like people do Islam. We do them like people do Judaism with the same kinds of intent. All contents got intent. Asa Hilya taught us that. But if the intent of your content isn't right, you don't really have any content, if you understand what I mean. 
because because your content must have an intent that's peculiar to the content. You can't have con African content, but you give off a Eurocentric Judeo-Christian Islamic intent when you try to explain what you're calling your spiritual system. And then you got all of this profane money attached to it, uh, um, training. You've got to have a better system or you're not going to get no more than 300 people involved in your system in a lifetime. And you got 3 billion people plus. It's interesting. Uh, you say that uh, just quickly because um, I'm, you know, revisiting uh, mm -hmm. the blueprint for black power. So he has a chapter on here, uh, consciousness as power. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things he, he keeps reiterating is that uh, consciousness and collective consciousness and culture is goal oriented. And so when you, when you bring up the issues that you just did, the fundamental question is what is the goal, you know, of these particular systems and do the people know and do they organize around that goal, you know, mm -hmm. to achieve that particular goal. Uh, but speaking of that, I want to kind of ask you in, in kind of in the same way that I asked about spirit to, to bring it back to the conference. When, when we say black excellence, how is that manifested in, in terms of, or, or better yet, what does that look like? How does that operate uh, ideally in a 2023 context? Right. And I think that's the main challenge for us, right? We use happy, referring to the happy river, and we use it looking at the time period when Kemet was at its zenith. And we're trying to look for modeling and how the economic system developed in Kemet to then begin to syncretize that type of modeling concept for developing the economic system in Chicago and Detroit and in, in New York and then North America, the Caribbean, and then the continent. That's what we're talking about. How do we get there, right? So I think of a concept like astronomy. Now, I may be some said I'm wrong in this. I don't think I'm wrong. And to think that our ancestors use astrology to explain the role of astronomy to the masses who had other things to do than look at some damn stars. But somebody had to look and study the stars and its movement and interpreted its meaning to the masses. And so how do I interpret astronomy? All that science and math, I can't tell the, the guy plowing the field, he ain't got time for that stuff. I can't even tell the guy making the linen, he ain't got time for that. Or the fisherman or the boat builder, all right? They got all these crafts, but they need this body knowledge to navigate life. And so we take astronomy and use astrology to explain the fundamentals of astronomy without burdening the people with the mathematic and scientific and observational details. So how do we do that with economics, right? How do we look at the economics of the Nile Valley? One of the greatest economic civilization that we can reference. We know there was some greater and before, probably, but we know this one. There's enough evidence left to show us its greatness, right? How does this society from a fishing village probably evolve into this enormous phenomena of a civilization? Economics is at the foundation of that. How do they begin to develop that economic patterning and that styling that allow it to sustain itself for the thousands of years that it did? Because what goes along with the economic has to be the ethical and moral behavioral controlling standards, the values, interests, and principle that determine how we behave in society. And the African, to me, appeared to their sociology was simply a replication of the greater ecology. You know? So I create this artificial sociology 
to replicate the cosmological and ecological ecology, and I got my harmony and my balance. How do we get that back into the black community? We got money. Last year, we spent $1.8 trillion. That's more money than Canada made last year. That's more money than Saudi Arabia made last year. That's more money than Russia made last year and quite a few other countries. So why are we talking about poverty? And that's just the African-American sector. We hadn't even talked about the Caribbean and Africa. So poverty exists among us, not because we haven't been able to amass capital, but we have not been able to take the riches we've amassed and turn it into wealth because there's something missing in the equation. And that missing thing is the ethical, moral barometers that comes when a culture is properly informed by some rules that have been proven to be, how do you say, um, real. You know, the movement of the sun is real, the movement of the star is real, the movement of the moon is real. And many other things that's observable when this plant grow, what season this plant grow in, what area this plant grow in, what this plant here is good for, why we can't eat this plant in this season, why we eat this food in this season, which may be crazy to people and they call you holistic nuts if you try to do this stuff today. But there is a science to all of that. An understood science that our ancestors had observed through millions of years of that type of observation. And so we are hoping how to take that knowledge of those ancestors that built that civilization called Kemet on the economic foundation they were able to do it on and find ways to replicate that in the 21st century in Black communities and Black families across the world which is not gonna be an easy task. But on one hand, again, going back to the last speech, I guess it might've been unhappy you did. It's not that difficult the way you explain it. We're just missing a body of knowledge that will help in our transformation. Those of us who dare to say we're the teachers so that we can better instruct the masses of our people on how to prepare themselves to go through their transformation. Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting that uh, in the, now I'm only making this as a suggestion, so I'm not making the argument that this mm -hmm. is a fact. Um, but in the, the latest text that I'm working on, there's a possibility that as a secondary meaning to the word Kemet, that it can mm -hmm. possibly mean market or market? marketplace. Yes, in marketplace. You, you won't find uh, an argument with me because you're not at the core of yeah. African <laughs> culture is what? That marketplace. It, in every country I've visited, that's at the core of every one of those societies. I like that. I never thought of that yeah. that way. So again, I'm not making the argument that is that that is a hundred percent fact, but mm -hmm. there is some circumstantial evidence as well as some solid linguistic evidence that, mm -hmm. on one hand, uh, Kemet, you know, uh, was seen as and can be interpreted as a marketplace, and and many people don't know that there's even the word Kim in the language. That means to purchase, to buy, to exchange. And, and, and of course, it has cognates in the languages in which I've uh, uh, analyzed and compared with ancient Egyptian. But most folks don't. They, they just lean heavily on the what they believe to be the spirituality aspect of it right. without understanding this component. And spirituality is your reality. It's, real. it's, it's yes. inclusive. It's inclusive. And, of all of the rest of your existence. I, I wouldn't have an argument. I would probably just haven't put it, you put it in the ether, fight to defend that position. And let me tell you why, because when we talk about, I remember when I was, I, I used to be an insurance agent. I've done a lot of stuff in my life. I worked with New York Life, John Hancock, Susan Ty, best of the whole nine, believe it. 
<laughs> but I did the whole corporate thing too for a minute. And um, an old guy told me that everything was about sales. He said, Small, you don't understand. So you don't want to sell things. But if you don't learn how to sell, you never make any money. And even just talking about my money, you know, the few dollars for selling a policy, he was trying to tell me that sales was everything, that you had to learn the marketplace. And when you think of it, right now, if African America, just take African America, want to turn itself around, we have to build a marketplace that's exclusively ours. Right now, we're making capital, but we're spending it in the Asian marketplace the Arab marketplace, the Jewish marketplace, and we spend less than 10% in the African-American marketplace. And so we are um, impoverished. If we were to redirect our spending into the African-American marketplace, we would then have the capital to expand both our retail and our wholesale possibility in terms of building an economic greater, a greater economic community. So that makes all the sense in the world. Kemet cannot grow unless it is a marketplace for the Af East, Northeast, and Eastern African world, even for the Western African world. Because if we were to take into consideration all the aquifers that's under the Sahara Desert, that was once rivers, if we were to take the rivers that's running from the Atlantic Ocean across to the very Nile itself via the Chad Basin, then we were very mobile at a period of time that we could be in what we now call Nigeria and a month or so go to what we now call Kemet, exchange our goods there and buy the goods from there we want and come back to what we call West Africa. And we did that. I know for a fact, you know, we know with the airway people, we know with the God people, we, we, we know with other groups that um, now settle in West Africa, who talks about this history of back and forth. And they weren't just exchanging um, commodities, they exchanged gods. And so you find most of the, I can find most of the gods of Kemet, most of the Neturu, I can find in, in, in a village just outside of Lome, Togo. Okay, all of them. The Ghana, the Ga people, their biggest holiday, which is called the Homowa, which is their beautiful festival, was done in July. They can't start that festival until they journey to Togo and get permission from the gods they brought from what they call it Nubia. And once those gods give permission, then the Wulama can go back to Accra and launch their celebration of what the Jews call Passover, but they call their Homoa. And they take the red mud from this mud pit. The mud looks like blood. And they painted over the doors of all the houses of the Ga people during this period so that the evil spirit, they say, would fly over them. Does that sound familiar? You know what I'm saying? So there's so much we need to understand. But that concept of looking at it as the marketplace, and it indeed had to be a marketplace to build the economic foundation that would sustain such a burgeoning civilization for such a long period of time. You know, there's no other civilization in the world that can talk about the longevity of exactly. its existence like you can in Kemet. It's interesting. Two things. The first thing um, you just reminded me in the conversation that we had with Dr. Uh, Susan Tata uh, mm -hmm. in in December, I was in November. Um, you know, again, we were talking about uh, polygamy. Um, but she was talking about how the, the men wasn't necessarily in the at the home primarily because they would have to, of course, go out uh, in part, look for new land because they were, you know, semi, uh, you know, season and stuff like this. But often to go to different marketplaces uh, to to find new markets and, and, and goods and stuff to exchange. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is. You know, again, trying to get the masses to kind of understand these concepts and make them more practical. One one thing that I've suggested and I and I've tried to implement, and and I'm making some calendars now, is 
you know, one of the problems that I have with, with Kwanzaa is that, you know, it's really kind of, in terms of the collective consciousness, really kind of only focused around that time at the end of the year. And so the question is, how do you make it, you know, in the forefront of the minds of the people all year long? Well, you know, I decided to name, rename each day of the week a principle of Kwanzaa. And the objective on each day is to do something within the framework of that principle on that day. And so um, so just like when when I started off the show, I said, you know, today is Kuumba, you know, Friday, January, you know, saying the 27th. And, and that's how we um you know and name our days but pretty much the same thing and i know others <laughs> that do the same thing but go back to any indigenous african community each yeah. one of those days in the week represent a, re a repetitive principle yeah very much aligned to the seven because kwanzaa is a baby right it's an infant oh, yeah. it was given birth to but it's an infant to be grown <laughs> um so, you know, a lot of times we think the baby, if you haven't seen the adults, you think the baby is the adult, you know? Yeah. But Kwanzaa is an infant. And it's a beautiful little infant. Yeah. But if it is going to replicate its mother and its father, it must grow. And that's what exactly. you're talking about. You know? And that's why, like, for like, for example, on Ujama, which would be, I believe, Wednesday um, for us. Like the objective is that if you're going to buy something on that day, you know, part of the, the, the ritual and the requirement is that you have to buy something from a black owned business and, and, and service so that we, we, we have that spirit of the economics, you know, we like every day we're pumping in the temporize the principles. Yeah, you know, exactly. if you go to Ghana, each day of the week has it's a, a name. market day. Yep. And everybody in the society take one of those names the day they were born on and and try to live out the principle of that day but each of the seven days have a name and that people always think kofi is the person name the kofi is that part of the person name that represents the day the person was born but the person has another name plus a family or, or collective tribal name and like I said, you've done the best job I've seen of studying the language because a lot of us have not been into the Bantu system, the indigenous African language system. Um, people have dwelled in the Arabic thing at the periphery with the Moors up in Northern Africa, or they've dwelled somewhat with the Swahili on the Eastern coast, but they've not really went into the core the way you've gone into it. And I think you're right on the path. It's about concepts, ideas, and principles and nothing is static. Things change as necessity dictates. A fundamental principle may be useful for a certain period of a people's existence and may not be useful for the next period. And they must discard that and come up with something else to replace that. The same thing happens when location changes. We leave Africa, a location change. We cannot possibly use the system in the same way. Even if we knew it top to bottom, you can't use it in the same way because the condition we find ourselves under in North America, Central America, the Caribbean, dictates a different kind of response. Yet we don't want to lose the fundamental principles that's intrinsic to our development as human beings. And that's where they bamboozle us with the religions because we hit our principles in there, we can't find them. All right, for the most part, some place you can find them. But in America, we hit Africa in the church and we can't find it now. But you can find it if you learn Africa, if you learn African language, then you can hear it in the music. You can see it in the dances. You can see it in the concepts and principles practiced in Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, especially in the Gulf region where so much of it is still alive. But you must now go to Africa and get to see Africa, because if you don't see what it's supposed to look like, you'll be looking at Africa and not know you're looking at it. Right there in your face. You know? It's right there in your face. Well, um, 
I, I hate to to cut this short, but again, this was last minute, and I'm sitting here in that cafe, and they'll be closing up soon. So I can I can continue on, you know, if, if you if you have more to say, I'm just going to uh, cut my my camera off and, and, and be shutting this stuff down, um, and and I could still be on my phone uh, doing this. So uh, let don't, me don't know if you want to rock. We don't have to prolong it. I think okay, okay. We've given a taste of the fruit to the people. Yeah. We can re go over who the guest is going to be. You know, Dr. Harris, our great leader from Chicago, I mean from Detroit, who is over the organization that Booker T. Washington founded, um, Dr. Susan Tata, who is from Pan-African Daily TV, Brother Risa Islam from the Nation of Islam, led by our great minister, Minister Louis Farrakhan, uh, Sister, uh, Sister Falou, Georgina Falou, uh, of African Puerto Rican, um, uh, Infidishi Jehudami, who is just one of the most brilliant scientists we've got in both the martial arts and the historic and, and spiritual science. Uh, Dr. Kaba Khomeini, who is scholar par excellence. And then we got the legendary Grand Nubia, you know, and we have our beautiful uh, sister uh, who, who's going to be rapping. We're going to have the showing of Happy we're going to have the show in uh, Heavy is the Crown. Um, and we're going to have some beautiful marketplaces uh, where there'll be many other interactions taking place. So this day of excellence, looking to see the importance of marrying your economics with your spiritual, with your culture, with your politics. That's a marriage that must be. Um, it's like polygamy, you know. The order in Africa was not polygamy. The order is monogamy, one man, one woman, because hell, most men can't take care of one woman. But there's a phenomenon in nature where for every one baby boy, three female children are born. That didn't just start yesterday. And so how do you reckon with that surplus female population? And Africa came up with a polygamy that was run by the female of society, right? So that we could keep not only the economic balance in the community, but we can keep the ethical moral harmony in the community. And each of these females will be able to participate in building a family and going through the function that nature designed the feminine to go through. But only the men who had the capability and the wealth would engage in this process. Not anybody can just say, I want three wives, because it wasn't the man's choice to start with. It's the woman's choice. She made that choice. And so that, that again, was tied into the economics, because a man who had a big farm and he's making money, he can have multiple wives, because he could take care of multiple wives. He can feed them. And with the new children, he can add to the expansion of his farm. You know, the man who was the chief priest, who had another avenue of wealth coming in, could do the same thing. This person uh, could have multiple wives because he had the excess to take care of multiple wives. And multiple wives wasn't about sex. This wasn't a sex orgy thing. Like we seem to think over here in the West, right? Multiple wives was about family expansion so that all of the members of society would be included in society, that the women would not be left because there wasn't enough men. And you had this excess population of female, which happens in every society till this day. We created a harmonious way to deal with it. And we created polygamy, where the women would become a part of a family and would not be on the street left to be prostitutes and misused by society because they were so, as happened in Europe and much of Asia. Mm. So we need to think about it from a different kind of space. And the economic um, harmony that that created um, is priceless. You know, it's priceless. So, Indeed, and, and I forgot to mention that uh, if you cannot make it to New York or if you're not in New York, York, 
uh, and, and can't make it. Uh, it is also being streamed live. So you can purchase a, an in-house ticket as well as a live streaming ticket. And so make sure that you go to hoppyfilm.com and hit the green, you know, purchase now button and it will take you to this particular page with all of the details, including the location and, and, and pricing, who's going to be there as well as bios uh, and the like. So of course, these are the, the guests uh, uh, who's going to be the host, Dr. Ken L. Harris, Brother Riza Islam, Brother Infidisha Jehuti Mess, Dr. Georgina Falu, uh, Professor James Small, Dr. Kaba Hiawafi uh, Kamini, and Dr. Susan Tata. And um, as was mentioned earlier, the filmmaker of the, uh, what's the second film? Uh, Heavy, um, is the crown, uh, Heavy is the Crown. Yes. Out, out of Darkness, Heavy is the Crown. Yes, the the producer of that film will be there um, as well. And of course... Amadeus Christ. Amadeus Christ. Yeah. And, Not to uh, be mistaken for Jesus Christ now, this is Amadeus Christ. <laughs> He's a filmmaker. Indeed. Okay. And um, Brand Nubian and Sister uh, Lyrical Faith will be in the house. So it is going to be a jam-packed day. I will yeah. be in the building and... Um, I hope to see some of y'all there physically, but if not, I'll catch you in the chat and uh, I'll let you have the, the last word. Uh, is there anything you want to say uh, before we go? Well, there'll also be an African dance and drumming group and I forgot the mm. name. I'll be strangled for that, but it's an extraordinary <laughs> um, performing group um, that will also be there. Um, and Jamar, Milton would be performing. Thank you. I forgot about Jamal Milton. Jamal Milton will be performing, and the African Dance and 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 Drama Corps will also be there. So it's going to be a full day with a little bit of everything from culture, from history, from science, from economics, from um, uh, spiritual systems, sacred science systems. Um, trying to look at ourselves and see how we're going to reinvent ourselves. You know. It's going to be a reinvention, a rebirthing of African consciousness, a rebirthing of African sacred science as applied. Because a lot of time we get to be the super spiritual people and we don't apply nothing and nothing changes. <laughs> we need to like get into the application of the science in our everyday lives so that we can change our world. So, Brother Asar, it's always um, an honor. Um, but I'm going to go and get me some rest. Like I said, I'm going to have to be in martial arts class in 11 hours. And I'm an old dude, so you got to get your rest and your sleep. Because I always work up for an hour in my home with Tai Chi before I go there. So I'm loose and, and strong. And then I'll go and I'm the oldest guy in the class. So the young people do go a little bit easy on me. Even I go like, don't be going easy. And they go like, oh, you can't choke the professor. He can choke you, but you can't choke him. Oh, don't kick him, you know, things like that. I go like, no, I got to be able to get beat up like everybody else, you know, to, to learn what we have to learn. And, and it's just a thing of being able to take care of yourself, walk in the streets, you know, being able to um, just take care of yourself. Um, we live in a crazy world. So peace and blessings. Hotep, my brother, um, it's always an honor. You're a hell of a teacher. Um, your scholarship is 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 just soaring like a star. You know, just keep doing the work, and the ancestors will give you their love, and the people will learn from you, and they will grow from you. And that's the key. But people don't just look at a star. Buy his books. Read the books. Apply what you can to your life, and it'll change your world. It'll change your understanding of reality. And that's where it has to start. You have to change your view. And you can't change your view without the appropriate knowledge. So buy the brothers' books and really begin to go through some self-transformation. And you will see your world change right around you, right in front of your face. 
So peace and blessings, my brother. I'll see you on the fourth. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm humbled by your words. Um, and, and thank you uh, for uh, coming in last minute. And yes, uh, the, the audience was really enjoying the information. And uh, make sure that y'all also visit um, Professor JamesSmall.com. And I'm sorry, what was the other link that you uh, mentioned Professor earlier? Small African World. That's my Facebook page, Professor Small African World. My Facebook is James Small. And just go Professor Small African World. And you'll find me. It'll kick up. They want you to find me because they want to see how the information is flowing. So they're going to make sure <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, who they are in the world. And they're going to make Indeed. sure you find me and see what we're talking about, you know. Indeed. Well, I appreciate, um, again, Brother uh, Taki and Sister Felicia and, and everyone else involved who I may not uh, know the names, but um, I know it's, it's always a team putting on these uh, events. So I want to show uh, love and give y'all a shout out as well, as well as, of course, those of you who uh, have made yourself known in the chat and those who are just, just watching and, of course, those of you who are catching us on the archive. So, again, uh, Hoppy Black Excellence Conference and Concert uh, will be happening in New York City on Saturday, February the 4th, 2023. Go to hoppyfilm.com. The link is in the description as, as well uh, to purchase your ticket. So if you're, you're not in uh, New York, you can still support the the event by uh, streaming. And you can watch while you're cleaning up, uh, doing some homework, uh, or, or studying uh, many of the works uh, that, you know, have been recommended over the years uh, to enhance and, your life. And the sorry, actual location is going to be the Jamaica Performing Arts Center in Jamaica, Queens, and at 153 10 Jamaica Avenue in Jamaica, New York. That's still New York City. That's one of the boroughs of New York, Queens, the borough of Queens. So the Jamaica Performing Arts Center in Jamaica, New York. Um, so I look forward to seeing you there or knowing that you're on the live stream, like the brother said, washing the dishes, cooking dinner, having a nice cold beer, if you like Brother Small. And I can always say, well, we created the beer. Why not have a nice one? <laughs> you know? yeah. um, thank you again very much. Peace and blessings. Love to everyone. All righty. Peace out, everyone. Talk to y'all later.